Spencer. I'm glad to welcome you again. We just had a wonderful conversation about your book, You Bet Your Life. And as I said to my audience, and I say now to all of those who are watching afterwards for their first time, uh, this is an opportunity that I've never had before, and I know viewers have always wanted. And what it was, Spencer, was for someone to interview me. Yes. And I said, there's no one I would want more to interview me than Spencer Christian, who I've loved his work so much. So we're turning the chairs, even okay, though we're in right. the same seat, yes. and I'm going to let you take over the show of Afterwards okay. for a few minutes. So well, go for I, it. I'm, I'm so honored that you chose me for this inaugural <laughs> event. Uh, you know, I have watched so many episodes of your show, and, and I've always been touched by the sheer joy that you bring to what you do. And it's infectious because as a viewer, I get enjoyment watching you do these interviews, watching you interact. I shouldn't even call them interviews. They're conversations. So what I wonder is, what is the most enjoyable part of your job for you? I'll tell you what it is. A, first of all, it's, it's not just meeting so many wonderful people. That, that's kind of a given when you do e any of the kind of work we mm -hmm. do. You know, yeah. you just get to meet people that you wouldn't normally get to meet. Right. My guests are some of the brightest and, and the best that there are. That's just the way it is. Yeah. But the true enjoyment I get out of it is I actually do have an underlying mission in what I do. And I, I've never shared this out loud, so I'll, I'll uh, share it now for okay. the first time being interviewed. <laughs> and, and that mission is that I firmly believe that my viewers, my guests, and myself must get a much deeper understanding of our world and our universe and develop a greater appreciation for our role in it. So no matter what I'm talking about, no matter what the guest is, no matter who the subject, no, wait a minute, no matter who the guest is, <laughs> right. no matter what the subject is, that's always my mission. And that's what always gives me that sense of enrichment enjoyment. I believe that's the infectious element that it's not said, yeah. but that's what I think I'm hoping my viewers are, are feeling at least, that they're, they're realizing this is a world that can be understood yeah. and that yes. their role in it is important. And I feel that as a viewer watching your shows because, as I said, your that sense of joy is infectious, but also your curiosity is infectious because I sense that you genuinely want to know all that you can find out about this person and you want to allow that person to reveal himself or herself. That is, in fact, that is why people say, you know, people say, well, you're the only guy that reads the book. Well, that's not really the case. I think there may be other people that read the books, mm -hmm. but I really do get that sense of, I want to know. And that's why I don't even ask questions. It's why it becomes a conversation. Right. Because I feel if I know, then I'd be almost lying to my viewers if I asked you things that I already knew about. Of course. Which then allows you, because you don't have to think of an answer to the question, <laughs> right. it, it allows my, my, my guest to go even deeper between the lines. And I yeah. really believe that in a society today, we need to go as deep oh, as we can. We really do. I, I, I'm glad that you mentioned that in society today, we can turn to a show like yours for thoughtful and thought-provoking conversation with civil discourse, because the, the nature of our public discourse these days is, is at rock bottom. It's really depressing to me. And you know, it's not really depressing. I, I almost think this, I'll, I'll reveal this for the first time. I believe it's almost what Richard Dawkins originally described as a meme. Mm -hmm. And that is a belief that we've all developed. Because, you know, when I speak to the average person on a daily basis, and I will tell you, there is bad discourse going on in our media, in our social media, and our politics, in our institutions. But, you know, you speak to most people, and I guarantee you, 95% to 99% all really do feel the same way, yeah. believe in the same thing, and we're almost creating this sense of discord via the way we are portraying ourselves. Yeah. But the truth mm -hmm. is, you ask, almost there's almost no real disagreements. You can pick even the, the let's talk about immigration right now. Yeah. That's one yeah. of the big... You know, problems that everyone seems to be, 
Well, no, it's not. If you really ask people, everyone's an immigrant. Mm -hmm. We're all from someplace else. We all, the only thing we want to do is just fix a broken system. <laughs> right. But we don't, now where we may disagree on is how do you fix the, the means, system. Right, exactly. You know, and it's the same with our medical system. It's yeah. the same with our educational system. But we all want the best medical treatment for everyone. Mm -hmm. We want the best health. We want the best education for our oh, children. Right. We, as Americans and as humans, we really all are on the same <laughs> side. <laughs> we're only making believe we're not. And I saw that in all my travels, all those years I was at Good Morning America. I was sent on so many wide-ranging assignments, traveled to all 50 states, and got to know, you know, the real America. Uh, and I've, I've felt the same way as you. We all had the same aspirations and goals and ideals and, uh, and desires for you know, creature comforts and for the best for our kids, but it was the means to get there. That, uh, and, and those means were uh, exploited by, people, by politicians to divide people and, and to create this morass that we have now. Now, let me ask you this question now. Okay, I'm back to now I'm, I'm asking. Why is that? This is what I don't get. We're both in the media. Yeah. We both approach the media very similar. That's what we've learned even when we, when we spoke on Between the Lines. And what I don't get is, where do they even see the value in doing that? Is it because it, they think it turns on more dials? Does it sell more newspapers? I don't even see it because I know most people are sick and tired of it. So you'd think if someone would step out of that line yeah. and stop towing that rope, they would maybe draw even a larger audience. Well, well maybe the, the pendulum, pendulum will swing back in that direction of having uh, more, uh, more civilized public discourse in, in, the, in the political theater. But, at, but today, I don't know what the solution is. To the, to the division. The divisions are so sharp and people demonize their opponents. They don't just disagree, they demonize them and pay, portray them as evil. Yeah, and that, by the way, once you do that, yeah. there's, there's no going yeah, back. No, you can't it, argue, it, with, and, and then they, com <laughs> they compare everyone to the big evils. Yeah, you know yes. what I mean? And then you go, yeah. well, you're comparing uh, someone to Hitler and Joseph Stalin. Yeah. Where do you go from there? Know. <laughs> you know? There's, there's well, no place else, is there? Well, I want to go back to, to your joy and your curiosity, because I've, I've wondered what the young, the very young Barry Kibrick was like. I mean, when you were 8, 10, 12 years old, what did you imagine doing with your life? You know, I, I, I didn't necessarily, the one thing I remember when I, I, in fact, I remember even saying this when I studied history in college was, I, I, I don't know why, but maybe I'd make it someday. I never <laughs> had a real vision of what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. I really didn't. I, I didn't until I actually started doing it. This is something I found interesting. I know a lot of people feel that they must have the passion first to find out what they're going to do. Right. And that right. never happened to me. It happened to me the other way around. Uh -huh. I started doing something that then I got passionate about. And I wonder if, hmm. I've always wondered if a lot of people who, you know, when they are young and they are concerned that they don't have this direction, they don't have this passion, I think it cripples a lot of people. And I was very blessed that that it didn't do to me. I right. always, like you said, and I quoted you on the show before, you always knew that you were going to make something of your opportunity. Yeah. I didn't have it bad growing up in the South. I didn't have the same issues, but I did have that same belief that I yeah. knew I was going to make something of my opportunity because I too, like you, had parents that gave me unconditional love. Right. And the importance of that cannot be it, it's, it's such a comforting and stabilizing thing in life. Uh, it, it gives you a sense of security uh, and, and the belief that you can achieve whatever you want. I, that's, uh, that's how I felt growing up with the, with the direction my parents gave me. I, I was in college in the late 1960s and I knew that I wanted to do something that utilized my communication skills. Um, I, I've always enjoyed writing, I enjoyed spe public speaking, I was an English major so I loved literature, but I, I didn't have it really narrowed down until about my junior year in college when I started volunteering in political campaigns. And I was fascinated by the way the news media covered the 
profound changes that were happening in our society in the late 60s, you know, the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War protest, uh, uh, the women's, women's movement, I decided then I wanted to be a journalist and I wanted to report on the big stories of the day and, and deliver those, those reports to the public. Well, you know, it's, it's very funny because not necessarily the same reasons, mm -hmm. but my favorite thing was always television. Now I know, and that was even when there were only three to four channels oh, yeah, to right. choose from. I remember those days. But I did yeah. love the medium when it too was done right. Yes. When it wasn't done right, uh, what is that, Marshall McLuhan? It's called a medium because it's rarely done. It's rarely well done, and it's just medium, right? <laughs> you know. So yep. the uh, the the situation though for me was that I did love mm. this medium and always wanted to do something in it, and that's how I finally did break in. I broke in in Anchorage, Alaska for an ABC affiliate, KIMO TV, uh -huh. and that story in itself would take, just to tell you, <laughs> it, 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 that's, a, that's a chapter in a book I'll have to write someday. But it was that attraction that I also felt I could lend my voice mm -hmm. to something that if I thought was not going right, I could correct. And in fact, it's why I left the news. Wow. Because I found that the news was getting, even back 20, 30 years ago, yeah, yeah. was already getting to be something that I wasn't comfortable with. Yeah, I, I understand that. You know, I never uh, aspired, before I got into TV, to be a broadcast journalist. I wanted to be a print journalist. I had no interest in broadcasting when I was in college. I never took a broadcasting course. And uh, tying into something you said earlier about finding your passion later, I knew I had a passion for journalism, but it wasn't until I stumbled into that first job in television that I fell in love with broadcasting. I went, oh, I like this. <laughs> you know, why, why did I think I was going to end up being a print guy? But I... I, I got to laugh. I mean, it's because true. I started in journalism yeah. in Alaska and wanted to go into print. <laughs> So I went to, I came to LA to be a writer. That's how I got to be a writer at first. And then what happened was very similar though. Yeah. I found myself losing the part of me that was the thing I did best. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, the, the person who probably helped me recognize that I was meant to be a broadcaster was the first news director who hired me, the guy I wrote about in my book, uh, who was like the, the Lou Grant character from the Mary Tyler Moore show. His name was Doug Hill. And I, I wrote to him to apply, to, to ask if I could come in and, and have an interview. I had heard that there was an opening for a news reporter at his station. Um, and I sent him some of my writing samples from college. He called me into his office. We met. We hit it off just like that. He gave me an audition on camera in the studio. I read some news copy, feeling completely comfortable, not intimidated at all. And he said, kid, you're a natural. You're hired. I, I, That's Spencer, how it started. I, what, I think we're separated at birth. <laughs> well, I, I know that sounds funny, but that's how I broke in in Alaska. Wow. I walked into the door, knocked on there. I can't give the whole story right now, but just quickly, the guy, my news director, John Valentine, he and I hit it off. He knew we had a chemistry, yes. and he put me on the air that night. Unbelievable. I went on the air that night, never doing it before. So again. My brother, Barry. My, bro <laughs> my brother, Spencer. Oh, Spencer, this has been a true pleasure. Thank you for Thank being you. the guinea pig on afterwards <laughs> and, okay. and taking on the challenge. Thank you guys for joining us on this new little feature we call Afterwards. And hope to see you again soon. Spencer, you're beautiful. <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> so much fun. Thank you. Oh, it was great.